Let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Father in heaven, as we worship this morning and as we study, we pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, help your grace. Just, uh, just bless us, Lord, please, and be here in this sanctuary and be present in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. If there was one problem that plagued the Israelites in most of their history, it was the temptation of idolatry, the paganism that surrounded them on every side. Idol worship had been forbidden to Israel in the commandments given at Sinai. God made it clear that he and he alone was to have Israel's undivided devotion and worship. The first four commandments given at Sinai formed the basis of how they were to approach God. And by the way, it still forms the basis of how we're supposed to approach God. So let's look at the commandments here. Commandment 1, Exodus 23, you shall have no other gods before me. You can say it. You shall have no other gods before me. Second commandment is Exodus 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, you can say it, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is under the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And I'll come back to that in just a minute, because I know you have some questions right there. Third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And, of course, the fourth commandment, one we know well, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And I've said to people, it's there, we didn't, we didn't make this up. We didn't slip it into the Bible. It's, it's right there, right? The Sabbath is right there. These four commandments shape the way we, that we were to relate to our God and our Creator. And as long as He exists, these principles will exist. So how long is God going to exist? Forever. Forever and ever. But let's go back to commandment number two again. Exodus 20, verse 4 says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, is that right? I, the Lord, wait a minute. There we are. For, for, I knew it hadn't changed. For I, the Lord your God, am, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. I want to just pause and tell you that this is not the picture of the God who says, if you sin against me, I'm going to get your children, I'm going to get your grandchildren, I'm going to get your great-grandchildren. And he goes out squashing them with his divine thumb. That's not the point. The truth is that when we make bad decisions in life, our decisions follow us, don't they? Amen. We make bad decisions in the home, in the family. Our children are affected by the decisions we make. They have to live with the consequences of the things we do. And, um, and, but, you know, God is a merciful God, and he can take even the most confused family arrangements. And if we submit to him, he can, he can make good come, come out of them. I know that, you know, I've told you my experience of the family that I grew up in, the kind of abuse that existed in our home. But I also know that my father was also a victim of abuse very similar to that. And it's very possible that his stepfather before him was affected by the same things. But my question is, what's the big deal about the images? Why this command? What was wrong with making images? Now, don't confuse this with all kinds of images. If you confuse it with the idea of art, 
you're missing the point of the commandment. There were images that were a part of the history and culture of Israel. Remember, Moses held a staff that had a, a serpent wrapped around it, made out of bronze, out of brass, when the Israelites were attacked by venomous snakes. And in actuality, that serpent and that staff become later on in the New Testament a representation of righteousness by faith in Christ because the Israelites had complained bitterly that God had abandoned them, that he wasn't protecting them, and so God removes his protection, allows the snakes to come in so that they can actually see what it's like when he takes his hand away. And then they were supposed to look at that serpent and believe, and, uh, and they would be healed. Now later on, Israel did take that staff and that serpent, and they made it into something to worship. They turned it into an idol. But even in the tabernacle, there were images. On the, on the Ark of the Covenant, remember, there are two angels with wings outspread over the Ark of the Covenant. And in, in, sewn right into the fabric of the curtains that separated the holy from the most holy place were um, angels sewn in gold thread into those curtains. So the idea is, that is being represented here in this commandment hasn't got anything to do with all of the images that you would see in art and things like that. It had a lot to do with the images that were used for the sake of worship. God did not want to be represented by an image of any kind. He is the invisible God whose appearance in Israel's history was marked by the cloud during the day and the pillar of fire during the night. Those who made images became like those, like the things that they worshipped. The psalmist in Psalm 115 talks about the gods of the Gentiles that they can't speak, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't touch. They have to be carried, picked up and carried because they can't walk. And then in verse 8, it says this, Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. It's a part of human nature that we become like the things we worship. You know, I ran across a passage this last week that was the catalyst for a lot of my thoughts on this topic. I was reading Isaiah 44, uh, my, my daily Bible reading. You keeping up with your Bible reading? Yeah? All right. You keep, keep at it, brothers and sisters. Don't, don't stop. Um, I think a believer ought to be able to say they've read through the Bible once, you know, at least once. We need to read through our textbook at least once, right? But Isaiah 44, verse 6 is what got me to thinking about this. God himself speaks here and he says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Isaiah then talks about the skills of the blacksmith and the skills of the woodworker. And in verse 14 of the same passage, he says, He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half he eats meat, he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. It says, They do not know or understand for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I also baked bread on the coals. I have roasted meat and eaten it. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. You can hear the irony of the word, shall I fall down before a block of wood? The Lord is making it sound foolish, because it is foolish. Amen. The craftsman takes a piece of wood, he uses part of it to cook his meal, and he bows down to the rest of it and worships it. It's ridiculous. And God is trying to make it sound ridiculous. 
The command not to worship images or false gods reveals that the things we worship are always the gods of our own making. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You know, in our culture, we don't see a lot of images of false gods. Um, my brother one time, when he served in Vietnam, brought back to my father um, a Buddha, because he wanted, he thought my dad would be interested in seeing it. I still have it, you know. I've had people tell me that I probably shouldn't have it in the house, but I, but I, I think when I talk to kids about, you know, images to worship, this is at least one illustration. In our, cultures, we don't, in our culture, we don't see a lot of that sort of thing. We're too sophisticated to set up the family idol to burn incense to. But we have a whole host of gods that we worship. Self-made gods to take the place of the one true God. We have a collection of other things that we have manufactured to worship. And when you think about it, ultimately, it's ourselves that we worship. When we fashion a god and we worship it, we are worshiping our own skills and our own ingenuity. In ancient times, I think idols had a place of status in society. The poor farmer who struggled to make a living had his little wooden image on the shelf at home and he would burn incense to it. The rich man um, had his image made out of gold or perhaps it was silver. We have our things that we give, that, that give us status, things that become more important to us than our commitment to our God. I'm not going to tell you that it's wrong to be wealthy because God blesses some with more. But just remember that being blessed with more comes with more responsibilities. The point of all of this is that the gods we worship in this life are almost always the gods of our own making. I believe that idolatry is in actuation, in actuality, an elevation of ourselves and worshiping ourselves. God's right to be worshiped is because he made us. We make our own gods as an excuse to worship ourselves. So how do you know that you have a false god in your life? Well, the question could be asked, what takes up the bulk of your time? Where do you spend your resources? What are you doing for the cause of the gospel? What things do you have in your life that you are not willing to give up for the sake of Jesus? And they may just qualify as our gods. In Matthew 19, is to, we are told the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He fell before the Lord and asked, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Christ's answer was to keep the commandments. Which ones, the young man responded. So Jesus begins to list the Ten Commandments. And the young man says, well, I have kept these from my youth. It was at this point that Jesus gave him a test. He called him to choose between the heavenly treasure and worldly greatness. Self must yield. His will must be given into Christ's control. He was offered the privilege of becoming a son of God, but he had to take up the cross and follow Christ in the path of self-denial. In Matthew 19, verse 21, I think I fell behind here. How are we? Here we are. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. His claim that he had kept the law of God was a deception because riches were his idol. He was the self-made man. He had earned a position of respect and he could not give it up. He could not keep the commandments of God while the world was first in his affections. You know that it is God who gives us the ability to make a living. What we have in this life is the Lord's gifts to us. But this young man loved the gifts more than he loved the giver. Christ had offered the young man fellowship with himself. Follow me, he said. If, if the man had followed through on Christ's request of him, we might have been reading books that he had written in the New Testament. We might have been reading a book about the gospel written by him. 
But Christ did not mean as much to him as his own name among men or the possessions that he had. To give up his earthly treasure that was seen for the heavenly treasure that was unseen was too great a risk for him. And so he refused the offer of eternal life in order to take the world. The Tsar of Ages makes this statement. It says, thousands are passing through this ordeal, weighing Christ against the world. And many choose the world. Like the young ruler, they turn from the Savior, saying in their hearts, I will not have this man as my leader. You know that Matthew tells us that when the man left, the young man left, Jesus said something that astonished the disciples. In Matthew 19, verse 31, well, I missed it. Anyhow, you can look it up in your Bible. Matthew 19, verse 23, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It says, When his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? See, the common belief was that if you were wealthy, it was because you were a good person, you were a righteous person, and God was obviously blessing you. The thought, was that it was, the thought that it was hard for a wealthy person to be saved seemed to be incomprehensible to them. If those who are obviously being blessed by God have a hard time making it into the kingdom, then who can be saved? The blessings that God gives to us are not ours to be kept. They're not to be kept to ourselves. When we hoard what God gives us, we make it our God. We elevate ourselves with the things that we possess. The gods that we worship are always the gods of our own making. You know, in Genesis, it tells us of the story of Jacob and how he had to flee from his brother because he stole the birthright. It tells us of his time with Laban working for Leah and Rachel. It tells us of the night of wrestling with the Lord. And to me, that story of the night of wrestling with the Lord is probably one of the most powerful stories in the Bible. You know what it tells us? It tells us that God consents to wrestle with his children. God who calls everything into existence. Remember Jacob, when he asked, what is your name? And the being that he's wrestling with says, why are you asking me my name? And Jacob will later change the name of that area to represent the fact that he had wrestled with God and his life had been spared. It's really an amazing thing when you stop and think about it that God loves us so much that he is willing to wrestle with us. He's willing to fight with us. You know, you, you fight for the things you really believe in, the things that you really love. And God is willing to fight for his children. I think that's amazing. You read the story of his amazing reunion with his brother, fearful because he had stolen the birthright, not sure what is going to happen, getting word that Esau is coming with all of his soldiers. And Jacob automatically assumes this is, this is it. And when they finally see each other and Jacob is limping because, remember, the Lord reached down and touched his thigh and, and, and wounded him. And so now he is hobbling in great pain, trying to get to his brother. And it tells us that Esau saw Jacob and wept and ran and threw his arms around his brother. You know, one of the most incredible things is when brothers who have had a falling out with each other embrace and, um, and express the love for each other that they once had, you know. Genesis 35 verse 1 tells us, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. The name Bethel means house of God. And he is to go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Verse 2 goes on to say, And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way in which I have gone. Everyone in the camp gathers up all of the idols that they have kind of hidden in their tents or 
under the bedding or wherever it was. Remember that even, even Rebecca had hidden one under a saddle that she had stolen from her father. You know, we don't, incl- we don't intend to collect the idols in our lives, but it happens, doesn't it? There are things in our lives that we know shouldn't be there. Things that we've allowed, things we're doing, we know they're wrong. Holy Spirit has been speaking to us, but we've collected them, we've hidden those idols. But somehow they get there, and like the camp, camp of Jacob, they have to be surrendered. So, Jacob passes word that all of the idols are to be gathered together and they are to be buried underneath the tree. And the Bible tells us that when the camp was cleansed from the idols, the fear of the Lord fell on the surrounding nations and they were allowed to pass unhindered. There is no telling what the Lord can do for those who put away their self-made idols to faithfully serve and follow Jesus. When God's people bury all the idols that are there, when they get rid of all the things that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to them about, it's no telling what will happen. That there will be things that we, we, we didn't dare believe would happen. The Holy Spirit will start performing miracles for us. You know, when I was thinking about this, my mind was drawn to a poem that was written in 1875 by William Ernest Henley. Now this is not a Christian poem, but listen to the wording and you'll get where I'm going. Here's his his poem. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. While it is a poem that reflects the indomitable spirit of man in the face of hardships, I take exception to the last stanza. I am the master of my fate and the captain of my soul. No, he is not. No, I am not. No, you are not. My fate, your fate, our future is not ours to control. But I know who my captain is. The only way that we can have hope for the future is to bury our idols under the tree and to surrender our fate, our future, to the captain of our soul, Jesus Christ. Now the problem is, for us, is that there are some idols that have to be buried. We need to stop the mutiny and surrender the control of our souls to our true true captain, Jesus Christ. We have to stop the things that the Spirit has spoken to us about. And we need to surrender the control of our lives to Jesus. We are not the captains of our souls. But there is one who is. And he has our future mapped out. He knows what he wants for us. And by the way, he is the best captain known. He will get you through the hardest circumstances, through the worst storms. The waves may be crashing around you, the lightning may be flashing, the wind may be roaring, but your captain knows what he's doing. This picture um, I have in my study at home. Harry Anderson, many of you will know, was a a very well-known artist in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He actually did art for a a lot of different groups, but uh, he was a Seventh-day Adventist. His daughter was a member of my church in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and when we got ready to leave, she went to her dad and asked him to sign one print to each member of the family. So I actually have, we actually have five prints signed by him, but four of them are signed to each member of our family. And um, 
at first, this wasn't my favorite picture. There was another one that was. But this is the one he gave me. And at the bottom, it says, to Eric Duran from Harry Anderson. Harry always signed everything in pencil, because pencil can't be forged. And, um, but I wound up in circumstances that put my faith to the test. And every time I would walk by that picture, I would begin to realize that it was almost a prophetic experience, that he had given me the picture that showed Christ at the wheel in perfect control. Harry was a, a master of expression. I don't know how clear that picture is from where you are, but if you look at the faces of everybody around him, the woman that's holding his arm, another person that's got a hold of his robe, you look at the face of Jesus and there isn't a shred of worry on his face. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly where he's taking us. And we can trust him. You look at the people that are holding on and they're at peace. In the middle of what looks like the ship being swamped, they're at peace because Jesus is at the wheel. I don't know what you're going through in your life. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know what's happening. For some, there are some real battles and struggles. Maybe, maybe it feels like the ship is going down. Maybe you feel like your life is about to sink. But Jesus is at the wheel. He knows what he's doing. Amen. Yeah, there's some things we have to bury at the tree. Things that we know shouldn't be in our lives, but they're there. Jesus comes to us in his love, his great compassion, appealing to us to make a change, telling us I, these things, you know they're wrong, and I'll help you, but you've got to let go of these. You've got to bury these idols, these gods, these things that take you away from me. But then he offers us the grace and the strength to make those changes. What do you think? You know that there are things there, right? I mean, everybody has them, myself included. You know there are things that are there. But we, we serve a Lord who can give us the power to overcome, can take them from us. He can heal us, make us whole. He can give us a sense of peace even in the worst storms. And more than that, our captain knows where he's going and what he's doing. He knows where he's going and what he's doing. How about it? How about it? You ready to make that commitment? Lord, I want to give away the things that I know shouldn't be there. And Lord, I surrender the path in front of me to you. He is the captain of our souls. Amen. He is the captain of our lives. He is the master of everything. He, he, is the, he is the one who has shaped our future. He knows what he has in store for us. And what he has in store for us is better than what we plan for ourselves. He always plans better for us than we would plan for ourselves. Father in heaven, I bring this church family to you this morning. And Lord, we come to you confessing, knowing that there are things that, that have to change. Things that we must give up. Please, Lord, give us the courage and the strength to turn away from the things that you have been speaking to us about that we know in our hearts that are wrong. Give us grace, dear Lord, to be faithful. But we surrender the control of our lives and our path to you. Whatever comes, Lord, we will trust that Jesus, your Son, Father, is at the wheel. That you know where the path is taking us. And Lord, we trust ourselves to you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Don't be afraid, brothers and sisters. The captain is at the wheel. He knows what he's doing.